Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Observatory Night at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Tonight, we're very pleased to be hosting the editor-in-chief of Astronomy Magazine, David Eicher, who is going to be presenting his latest book, The New Cosmos, Answering Astronomy's Big Questions. Now, when I was reading this book, I started thinking back to the state of our knowledge just about 20 years ago. You know, when I was in graduate school, we didn't know of a single planet orbiting a star other than our sun. The Hubble constant was only known to within a factor of two, which means that we literally didn't know if the universe was 10 billion years old or 20 billion years old or somewhere in between. And nobody even suspected the existence of dark energy and the accelerating cosmos. And that is exactly the point of this book, The New Cosmos. Dave Eicher doesn't just do an overview of astronomy. He actually focuses on how our knowledge of the cosmos has grown and evolved over the past decade or two. He reminds us of how our knowledge is refined over time, you know, whether it is the value of the Hubble constant or the mass of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, we're always getting better and better information. And most importantly, he reminds us that the beauty of science is that every time that you answer a question, it raises entirely new questions. So that is part of the excitement of science, in my opinion. One of the things that struck me the most when I was reading this book is how much Dave's personality comes through on every page. Just to give one example, when he's talking about Mars, he doesn't just give you some of the evidence for there being water on Mars. He takes you through the specific local minerals and global geology that we have learned about from the rovers and spacecraft. So he really makes the planet come alive. Now, tonight's speaker, David Eicher, has worked at Astronomy Magazine for more than 30 years. I first met him in 2002 when he became editor-in-chief, and I was newly hired and just starting my position here at the Center for Astrophysics. And this will be his second time speaking here at Observatory Night. Over the course of his career, David Eicher has written eight books on astronomy and written or edited hundreds of articles. He has appeared on TV programs, on CNN, on Fox News, on NPR, all over the place. He has written planetarium shows for the Adler Planetarium in Chicago and scripts for NASA as well. And he even has an asteroid named in his honor. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming David Eicher. Thank you, Christine. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Christine. I really appreciate it. Can you hear me okay, everyone? Good. Well, thanks for coming tonight. You're very brave. And all we have to do is solve all of the problems of the universe, and then we're all done tonight. So um, what I'd like to do is share, as Christine said, is to share uh, a little of enthusiasm for the past decade or 10 or 15 years when we've really undergone a revolution in astronomy, astrophysics, planetary science, and cosmology, because many of the big questions that we've had for as a, as a species for uncountable years, ever since humans looked up at the bright things in the sky and wondered what they were, we're really getting to a close point of understanding many of those big, big questions. Um, we do have a bit of a paradox uh, with astronomy, the amateur astronomy, and the professional astronomy worlds right now, because now we're awash in data and information and exciting discoveries. Exoplanets, uh, gravitational waves from colliding black holes, right on down the list. Terrific spacecraft 
missions, but we've got a relatively sleepy hobby of astronomy. So I'm going to talk about some of the factors, not just what's going on in the science a little bit tonight, but first of all, a little bit what's going on in the sort of public perception of astronomy and allied sciences and what we can do about that. I do want to uh, mention uh, a few of the topics. First of all, uh, Christine very nicely mentioned the book, The New Cosmos, uh, which I'd be happy to sign. And this is, forgive this commercial interruption here. Um, it, it won't happen again, maybe. But let, let, me, let me just read, I mean, these are some of the, the seriously, these are some of the topics that, that we've had really a quantum revolution recently in understanding how the sun will die as a planetary nebula and the specific way in which it may expire. And don't worry, it's a long time coming. The end of life on Earth, that's also a big, big deal. We now understand when that will likely happen. Uh, how the moon formed, we still don't know absolutely, but we have a pretty good idea now. Where has all the water gone on Mars? Um, how Venus turned itself inside out as a planet volcanically. Is Pluto a planet? We'll get to that in a minute here. Um, the exoplanet explosion, the barred spiral nature of the Milky Way galaxy we did not know about until less than a decade ago. Uh, the coming Milkamada, Andromeda Milky Way, Andromeda Galaxy Mil Milky Way uh, collision and merger that will be coming as well, we did not know about until recently, the details of the Big Bang being refined, the size of the universe, uh, the mystery of dark matter, which we still don't completely understand, and we don't understand dark energy at all, but we know that it exists. The ubiquitous nature of black holes existing probably in the trillions, the fate of the universe, and we'll have some fun with this one, the meaning of life in the universe. So I don't want to make this overtly commercial, uh, but this is a good bargain because not only it's some good reading about astronomy, and I don't know what your families are like, and you're trying to get younger people into the hobby, but this also is a good booster seat, and if you have any household projects, a doorstop. So keep that in mind as well. But seriously, let's talk a little bit about how we're progressing in terms of our knowledge about the universe and where, why we're here maybe even and how we got here. The evolution of understanding how life got going on Earth now has taken huge strides in the last decade. We now know that it's a likely place that hydrothermal undersea vents, black smokers, may have been the convenient place for the molecules of life to get going. Um, we know that uh, Comets, the only comet that's been sampled, contains the most primitive amino acid, glycine, one of the building blocks of life. And we know that probably life originated here without being bombarded in necessarily by comets and asteroids because the constituent atoms and molecules that combine the way they do were abundant in the oceans of early Earth. And that early Earth was Unlike those pictures that we all saw in grade school with a raging, hot, incredibly dark, violent, uh, stormy Earth, it was really a cool early Earth now that was a, a pretty, um, pretty good place for life to get going. We don't know yet whether it was an RNA world that got going first or a DNA world or a lipid world in which cellular structures got going and then RNA and DNA uh, progressed from there. But we do know that once life got going on Earth, um, Darwinian evolution took hold very quickly. And we have no idea whatsoever, but if you talk to people like Richard Dawkins and others who are biologists, they believe that the logic of the universe and that which we observe, the chemistry of other worlds through spectroscopy, would perhaps imply that Darwinian evolution would work everywhere in the universe. That's something that we have to explore a long time from now. But to be born in the cosmos, to be made of the stuff, as Carl Sagan used to say, of star stuff, and to be able to contemplate, to be sentient and to understand and to look up into the Milky Way and understand what those twinkles of billions of stars are in our galaxy, and to think about it ourselves is pretty incredible. We also know the numbers of sentient beings now on Earth were also pretty incredible because by most estimates about 108 billion people have lived 
in the history of Earth at a minimum. In Roman times, there were about 300 million people alive on this planet, about a half a billion by the Renaissance, and about 7 billion today. So that's an incredible thing that life flourishes, and everywhere we look in extreme environments, of course, on Earth, and extrapolate that out into other places in the universe, it seems that life uh, is easier and easier than we ever imagined to take a foothold and to survive in extreme environments. And that's pretty incredible, because life itself is a near-death experience. <laughs> well, despite the almost incredible nature of life on Earth, of an inhabited planet, there's something of a little bit of an undercurrent of sadness uh, with our culture, I would say, of unfulfilled promise on this planet as yet, if you will. Carl Sagan used to tell me that 99% of everyone is born, lives out their life on Earth, and dies without really understanding their place in the cosmos. And that's something that I don't know if that situation is really improving over time, unfortunately, at this point in our civilization. Um, allow me just to make one more commercial. But it's not really, a, it's an equal opportunity commercial. Because um, let, let me just give you an example of Astronomy Magazine, uh, which I work for, is the largest sort of astronomy enthusiast group in the world. We have about 100,000 print subscribers and 400,000 people a month go to our website. And we have about 1.2 million followers on social media. So that's a good crowd of, of people who really express an interest in astronomy and in the cosmos. Uh, these, these numbers seem solid, but they sort of mask, if you will, um, an aging of the hobby, as I mentioned, of the people who are really seriously interested in this stuff. Um, so where is the younger generation? That's one thing that I like to talk about. And if I can mention just very briefly, this is an equal opportunity uh, moment because astronomy is one thing, but I had dinner last night with some friends near here, and Peter Tyson, the editor of Sky and Telescope, was at the dinner, and we had a lovely time, and I even brought him a glass of wine. So the two <laughs> magazines get along just beautifully. <laughs> it's true. It's really true. Um, well, there seem to be, unfortunately, some barriers for younger people getting into serious science these days. And I think that we live in sort of an environment now, of course, with our phones. We all want to be looking, of course. I'm surprised that I haven't seen any of you pull this out yet. And, Look at it, you're a very polite audience. But, you know, everyone, of course, who's my son's age, who is a young person, you know, they're always looking at their phone. And we also get many, many choices, of course, now uh, when it comes to entertainment. So how do we make things that are serious and one might argue worth knowing about? And I'm not trying to call out any particular group of people or age group of people, really, or any political candidates. But how do we get people who really may not necessarily be engaged with the value and the meaning of science and knowing about serious things more engaged in a way when you can get a sort of a glimpse into the world of science uh, just by flipping around on your television once or twice a week for a few minutes? Well. Reality, it seems, no longer seems as important as it once did, say, a generation or two ago. Now you can take some young people out into the field and show them, say, an aurora, which doesn't necessarily look this bright unless you're in Alaska or Iceland, but uh, it's pretty impressive. You know, you've seen it, probably a shimmering aurora that moves sort of in real time. They might say, wow, that's pretty cool, you know, and I understand, you know, and charged particles spiral into Earth's magnetosphere and produce this, and, you know, and I'm going to go back in then and, you know, play with the Xbox 360 then, you know, after about 10 minutes of that. So what is real is not necessarily valued so much anymore, and that's a challenge, I think, for people who care about the universe and the meaning of science in our lives. Um, and of course, it's harder now for young people and for anyone, most all of us, to get uh, easy access to a dark sky. So things are not 
improving necessarily in that respect. And on top of that uh, challenge, we now live in a culture of uh, total entertainment oversaturation. 24-7 now, you can get anything you want to watch and to, you know, get in there and be a fan and know about all the episodes. And I'm, uh, I'm not trying to beat up on us as a culture, really, you know. Trust me, I'm really not. But, you know, I love movies and I love sports and entertainment and stuff, too, and music. Um, but, you know, I counted before I came here 253 HD channels on my own cable television and you know that's it's incredible I mean that's pretty excessive and too many people lay back too many times and just kind of let things come to them and that sort of initiative to go out there and to understand things get involved in them in a deeper way is sometimes a little bit of a challenge for us I'd like to cite just a couple of examples here and if you uh, I hope you forgive me if there are any fans here. But uh, <laughs> this is typified, at least in the United States, States in a strangely unique way um, by so-called reality television, which, as far as I can tell, is about the farthest thing from reality that exists. Um, whether it's Duck Dynasty, Amish Mafia, The Undateables, Dog the Bounty Hunter, The Biggest Loser, Ghost Hunters, or I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. It's bound to enrich your life just a little bit with every episode, more so than knowing about the universe without, around you. And, that, and that's sort of the challenge that we face intellectually, I think, with a large part of this culture. And I don't want to beat up on this guy because he's great. And I love Morgan Freeman. I really, really do. Um, you know, his support of Mississippi Delta Blues, I love that. I, I'm really into blues music. Any blues fans here? God bless you. Okay. Um, he plays a good god, too, and I love his movies. But, uh, you know, his show about science that, that is one, and, and, and this is one among many television shows that is purported to be science programming. Um, and remember, if you say it enough times, they'll believe it, uh, is not necessarily a purveyor of science. These are actual episodes that I'm going to read the titles of to you, if you'll permit me tonight here. Is there life after death? Does time really exist? Is there a sixth sense? What do aliens look like? By the way, if you have any answers to these, I'd like to know now, okay, if you wouldn't mind interrupting. Um, can we travel faster than light? Is reality real? Does the ocean think? I'm not making this stuff up, okay. And is a zombie apocalypse possible? That's science programming. So, back, enough complaining, though, huh? You didn't come here tonight to hear me complain about everything, did you? Um, well, lost in the crazy way that science often gets presented, at least on television and often in our internet streams, um, there's an exciting revolution, as I mentioned, going on. And I'd like to talk a little bit more specifically now about the things that have really moved forward and are very exciting for us to know about, and maybe even share some of the excitement about with our friends, colleagues, family, neighbors, and anyone else who will continue to talk to us after we've talked about the main sequence life of it. No, never mind. Okay. <laughs> well, we know a lot about the big questions, of course, as I mentioned. We know now that about 7 billion years from now, the sun will, uh, following its red giant stage, which will happen about 5-ish billion years from now, will transform into a planetary nebula, of course, and this star that's the central star is the star that is die, that is run out of the normal fuel, of course, to burn. And in an episode that's not explosive, like a supernova, but rather, and Bruce Balak actually is the guy who's done a lot of the work with Adam Frank and others over the past 10 to 15 years on this, actually has episodic uh, releases of gas. It's almost like a bel series of belches, if you will, 
or as Bruce likes to say sometimes, one of those things where you try to start a motor with one of the of a, of a grass cutter, you know, a lawn mower, with one of those yank cords, you know, and it kind of sputters and starts halfway and so on. Well, these belches of gas at the end of a life of a solar mass star send out some low velocity gas and then higher velocity gas that creates this shock front. And the, not like these lights, but like fluorescent lights then, this planetary nebula will glow for a period of about 50,000 years. And this is the way stars of the mass, uh, roughly of the mass of our sun, expire. And so that will happen to our sun, and we won't be around to see it, thankfully, uh, a long time from now. But uh, for a brief time, inhabitants of other worlds, if they're there in the Milky Way, will see our solar system expire in this glowing cocoon. We don't know whether it will be a spherical planetary nebula, by the way, or a bipolar nebula, or what the structure will be, because there's a lot of work still going on about why the different structures happen. That's another chapter to come, yeah. Okay. Well, the sun is about halfway through its normal life now. It's as a normal star. So, you know, most astronomy groups I talk to and, and thinking myself, it seems like sensible, shouldn't it, that, that about half of the history of life on Earth should be over too, right? If the sun's about halfway through its life? Doesn't that seem reasonable? You know, somebody told me astronomers don't even wake up until about 9 o'clock. Is that true? No. <laughs> well, actually it's not true because the earliest known life on Earth uh, cyanobacteria, primitive microbial fossils, are at least 3.4 billion years old. Those are from the, these shown here, from the Strelly Pool in Western Australia. There may be some fossilized bacteria uh, that's even older, that's 3.8 or 3.9 billion years old. And now we know, thank courtesy of that star that's going to abandon us eventually, that uh, and trust me, I'm not trying to bum you out here either with the science tonight, but, but within about a billion years or so from now, because the sun is increasing its luminosity over time, it's a variable star, and its luminosity is increasing over time. So about a billion years or so from now, the water on Earth will boil off, the oceans will be gone, and that will kind of ruin our week. <laughs> so... The downer is that we've only got about a billion years to go here as a civilization maximum. But that seriously means that about 80% of the story of life has already been written back to the origin of life on Earth, which is pretty amazing when you think about it, given that the sun is halfway through its normal life as a star. Well... The moon also has, uh, planetary science has really undergone a, a revolution over the last decade. The origin of the moon remains a little bit mysterious, but there's very, very good evidence that the moon resulted from what's called the giant impact hypothesis. And this is about 4.53 billion years ago in the early solar system, a Mars-sized planetesimal Lots of planetesimals were flying around in the inner and outer solar system at that time. Smacked into Earth, it's called Thea now by planetary scientists, and a lot of it was absorbed, but it blew a ring of material from the collision off of Earth that uh, accreted into the moon. And so uh, that's called the giant impact hypothesis, and you can explain the isotopes the oxygen elemental varieties that are in earth rocks and moon rocks, both lunar meteorites and the moon rocks that have been brought back by Apollo astronauts uh, by this hypothesis. And a bunch of other things can be explained as well. So it appears that we had a big collision, and it also now appears that Pluto, uh, to create its moons with the New Horizon data that we got last year, also had one of these big impacts and that was the way that it got a moon that was very large compared to uh, whether you call it a planet or a dwarf planet, compared to the main body there, too. We know that Mars had a lot of water, of course, on it early on, uh, on the surface. There's abundant evidence everywhere you look, of course, with the rovers and with 
orbiters and all sorts of other data that we've collected since the days of Viking that Mars had abundant flowing water on the surface. We now know that, of course, a lot of water is locked up in the polar ice caps and uh, subsurface ices and that there are probably uh, subsurface liquid aquifers flowing on Mars. And why exactly did Mars go from wet to being very dry and very cold, and how did it lose its atmosphere and most of its water? That's a key question that there's a lot of work on. There are some answers there, but they're, they're not simple. Um, so that's something that does require a little bit of reading. Ditto with Venus, our so-called sister planet that's really nothing at all, of course, like Earth, as you know, I think. Uh, it's very hot and very hellish, uh, 900 degrees Fahrenheit. It would be a bad day uh, for anyone to approach the surface of Venus. It was a bad day even for a spacecraft that landed on the surface of the planet and didn't last very long. But we know now, uh, over the past generation, um, and largely from the Magellan spacecraft data that got analyzed for many years after the early 1990s, that Venus uh, was a planet that uh, that as they like to say in the colloquial, threw up on itself and resurfaced. You know, you can't tell kids, oh, sorry about that. That's, that's really not, it's, it's an adult topic here. But Venus somehow, and, and the energy in Venus very early on uh, was pent up and there was enormous amount of magma in Venus. And at some point, uh, and this was something on the order of three quarters of a billion years ago, the planet uh, reached a critical point and had a volcanic massive eruption and Venus resurfaced. And you can tell that this happened because there are very, very few craters on most of the surface of Venus and so we know the surface age is very young. So why that happened exactly and could that have any implications for the volcanism on our own planet? Well, we don't know the answer to that yet either. Well, can I just ask a quick question? How many people consider Pluto a planet here? I love to ask this question. And I'm going to email Alan Stern right now, in fact, <laughs> with a response like that. Okay. Awesome. And I'm not going to CC it to Neil. No. But uh, dwarf planet? Okay. And, of course, as Alan would say after he's ranted about Pluto's planetary status for half an hour, a dwarf planet is a planet, you know, so it's both. But, you know, this is an important question, of course, with the New Horizons data, the magical, incredible exploration now of uh, Pluto that we had last year and the amazing amount of data that's still coming back. You know, it was a flyby, but the data rate is so low that we're getting new data now for months, you know, so that will continue to, there'll be new images and new data continuing on as if it's a, an extended spacecraft mission, which is exciting. And we're just really starting to understand Pluto and, of course, its moons uh, as well. That's exciting. Um, but there are important questions there, you know, and I write about Pluto, and I knew Clyde Tombaugh at the end of his life when I was there in the 1980s in Las Cruces and at the Texas Star Party and hanging out with David Levy and Brian Skiff. And I'm glad that Clyde didn't get to see what's happened with the IAU here. But, um, you know, Alan would argue, and I sort of support that argument in my book, and you can see it a lot of ways, but, you know, why should um, location matter in defining an object? You know, a house is a house, whether it's on Beacon Hill or out in the countryside south of Concord. So why should a planet be a planet at one astronomical unit from the sun and if you move it out to 40 AU, where Pluto is, it doesn't clear its orbit of smaller bodies. Therefore, it's not a planet. That's a sort of a flawed series of thoughts, I think. And, and uh, you know, that's astronomers trying to do planetary science. The problem that's even greater with that definition from the IAU is that since 2006, when that occurred in 2011, we found, you know, this business about clearing its body, of, uh, of clearing its orbit of smaller bodies. Earth hasn't done that. There's a, an asteroid in Earth's orbit that's separated from our planet by 60 degrees, an arc, and not to mention Jupiter and so on and so forth. So um, it's not a good definition. But that's, so, so there's a, a, a lot of, if you, if you love to argue about Pluto, this book is for you too. <laughs> Who doesn't?
You know? Okay. Well, only it's sort of astonishing, you know, only in the last eight years, really, and, and 16 years for the initial observations, have we really figured out the barred spiral nature of the galaxy, of the Milky Way, our own galaxy. It's hard to understand galaxies and have a picture of what they're like when you're inside one. It's easy to shoot a galaxy like M83. Of course, you may know in Hydra in the southern sky, that's about a one-third scale model of the Milky Way. It's very similar, and it looks more or less like our galaxy does, a barred spiral with the same general kinds of arms. Um, but it's smaller. But it's very hard to figure that out from the Milky Way. So a group of astronomers in 2000 and 2001 discovered this so-called long bar of the Milky Way because ever since 1923, we had thought the Milky Way was just an ordinary spiral galaxy. Well, they discovered this bar in the Milky Way structure about 15 and 16 years ago, the data, and then a, an experiment called GLIMPS flew on the Spitzer Space Telescope, and there's a pretty good association with that here, by the way, um, in 2000, 2008, and I'll put in a plug for uh, the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. You don't get to mention that school in astrophysics very much. That's where um, Bob Benjamin is, who was the project scientist on Glimpse near where I live. And that project mapped the spiral arms and the spurs of our galaxy and the barred structure in 2008 only, so that we know the structure of our galaxy very well now. Also at a place, uh, the association with Spitzer, also at a place called Harvard University, Avi Loeb, who happens to be the chairman of the Department of Astronomy, I believe he still is, um, and his team, he was the one who, with a couple of partners, uh, investigated um, the Milkometa collision. I mentioned that the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way will eventually collide, commingle, and merge into one galaxy. And of course, this is what galaxies do with their friends. They eat them. Because <laughs> on large scales, everything is moving away from everything else in the universe because of universal expansion. But on smaller scales, of course, gravity can be very effective. And the Andromeda galaxy has a blue shift toward us. It's moving toward us at 520 kilometers per second. So that's come, that's moving, you know. Of course, it's not, doesn't mean much to us in our lifetimes. We see one frame, as Carl Sagan used to say, of the cosmic movie. But about three and a half to four billion years from now, these two galaxies are going to come together and do a galactic dance and merge. There won't be a lot of pileups on the freeway with stars smacking into each other because galaxies are mostly empty space. And if you had the sun as a pea in sitting there in Paris, then the next star that would be about the size of a pea would be in Berlin. There's a lot of space between stars. But the heavy mass of the centers of the galaxies will co-mingle and collide and come together. And we may eventually have a galaxy that looks like a big mess like Centaurus A. That's a big spheroidal peculiar mess. So unfortunately, we'll miss that show. And we'll miss the observers of galaxies always say, ah, you know. We don't have to, we don't get the Andromeda galaxy covering, you know. 3,000 square degrees of sky, you know, damn it, you know, but what are you going to do? So that's a long time off. Well, there are some things that we still don't know the details of, but we know a lot more than we did a generation ago. And one of them is that as early as 1932, astronomers postulated unseen matter, of course, in the universe to help, first of all, explain the orbital velocities of stars in the Milky Way. And then Fritz Zwicky got in on the equation and cited uh, a missing mass in galaxies because of the rotation of galactic arms. Then Vera Rubin came along and did a huge amount of work and essentially discovered uh, and defined dark matter that it really exists. Um, and we still don't know what it is. But uh, Planck, uh, the Planck satellite tells us that 26.8% of matter energy in the universe is dark matter. 
course, matter and energy are the same thing in different forms, and you can prove this if you really want to by eating a cookie and running across the campus here <laughs> and converting mass into energy. That's the fun way to do it. Or, you know, you can work out the equations, you know. <laughs> okay, and if that wasn't enough of a mess, what could dark matter be? And, and maybe, just maybe, it's a hypothetical particle called, an axi called axions. It's probably not big stuff like black holes and free-floating planets unbound and so on. It's probably a particle that we haven't discovered formally yet. Uh, but if that wasn't enough of a mess, then in 1998, these teams of supernova researchers came along and, and caused an even bigger problem um, for cosmology and astrophysics and saw that these very distant supernovae were uh, receding faster than they should be. Uh, and that some repulsive force is acting to speed up the expansion of the universe. And boy, oh boy, you want to talk about a real mess in terms of understanding the universe. Because something like three quarters of the matter and energy in the cosmos now we know is this dark energy. But we have no idea what it is. And if anyone has any ideas, I'd really like to split a Nobel Prize with someone. <laughs> if you want to get together and talk afterward, maybe. We can, you know, run through it. Um, but there are a lot of people, I mean, a large percentage of cosmology now is working on that problem, seriously, which is a major problem. Um, when I was a young editor and I first went to Astronomy Magazine in 1982, black holes were sort of kind of more or less a rumor. Still, not exactly. But uh, they had been hypothesized by an English natural philosopher called John Mitchell in 1782 that there were dark degenerate stars in which gravity was so powerful that nothing but light could escape. Um, there were a few candidates by the 1970s of what in the Milky Way of collapsed stars, and the most important one was Cygnus X1, that astronomers suspected were black holes. And Stephen Hawking and Kip Thorne famously made a bet about whether Cygnus X1 would turn out to be a black hole or not. And by about 1990, they settled the bet and agreed that Stephen, who had wagered for a one-year subscription to Popular Mechanics, had lost. <laughs> and Kip had won at Caltech. And what Kip had wagered for was a one-year subscription to Penthouse. So the moral of that story is never make a bet with Kip Thorne. Because if Hawking loses to him, you know, wow. Um, but seriously, by the, by the, not only did we have stellar black hole candidates now, and we only know of a couple dozen in the Milky Way, really, of absolute the existence of stellar black holes, but there must be millions or trillions even. Um, and certainly in the universe, there are many, many trillions. But in the late 1980s, also, John Cormandy and his research group and a number of other people started finding, of course, supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies that are millions or even billions of solar masses in, in extent. Uh, and we now know that most all galaxies that are normal galaxies, not dwarf galaxies, they're not good enough to have a central black hole, not massive enough. Most galaxies, not dwarfs, have a central supermassive black hole, and that means that there, and we know of a, roughly, calculate roughly 100 billion galaxies in the universe. So there's a lot of black holes out there. Uh, but not all of them do. Not all normal galaxies do. M33, some of you observers might know, the Triangulum, the Pinwheel Galaxy, it's a nice normal SC galaxy in the local group, has no central black hole. So you never know. All right, well, where do we go from here? Um, well, this is a picture of everything in the universe that ever was in one slide. And of course, the Big Bang is over on the left, and then cosmic inflation, the dark ages, and the first stars and galaxies and black holes. And we're over here, you know, with planets and cats and dogs and trees and stuff over here on, on the, and actually this needs to be fixed to make it 13.8 billion years now. This is obviously not European or from this year. Um, but one of the interesting questions that really has to be done yet, and this is one of the driving factors for the Webb Space Telescope, is how did matter really get formed in the early universe? We don't know the formation sequence yet, 
of stars, galaxies, and black holes. Did galaxies come together as aggregations of mass that then gave birth to black holes in their centers and created star formation in their arms, in their disks? Or did black hole seeds come together around which galaxies formed, or the unlikeliest, did stars start forming and then they fell into galaxies? Nobody knows yet. And that's a major question about the early universe. And so that's something that we hope that Webb will decipher for us. Well, here's one thing that we can be certain of. The universe is really big. This is Alpha and Proxima Centauri here. No, I think this is not the version in which Proxima is. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah, if you can see the little, can you see a little red circle below Alpha there in the, the left, uh, lower left center there? That's Proxima Centauri centered. And this, this multiple star system is the closest one, of course, to our sun. And is Proxima is about 4.2 light years away, 24 and change trillion miles. If, if the, the fastest transport that we can now think of, and of course it's exciting to talk about this now with Stephen and his friends having announced their project to send uh, micro robots on their way. Uh, but if we wanted to transport people these kinds of distances, um, it would take an enormous amount of energy and time, and it would take at least something like 75,000 years to get there with the best technology that we can now envision. And that's assuming that Congress cared about science enough to fund it. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, so, you know, if you're going to take a 75,000 year journey just to get to the nearest star, you got to put a lot of stuff in the pantry, don't you? I mean, they're, you know, our science fiction stories we love, but they're real practical and logistical issues that come about with traveling between star systems. It's an incredibly, incredibly long distance just to the nearest star. So that's something that we can contemplate, of course, for the future. Um, now, at least, we know the numbers game, roughly know the numbers game pretty well. The Milky Way contains at least 200 billion stars and possibly 400 billion-ish we don't know exactly because dwarf stars that are the most numerous are very, very faint over long distances, but it's several hundred billion stars. We know, as I mentioned, that there are at least 100 billion galaxies out there, and we skipped a whole lot of things tonight, you know, but one of them was cosmic inflation. And if Alan Guth comes over from MIT, he's not going to be happy. But if inflation is true, which it probably is, most all cosmologists have high confidence in inflation theory, then the universe might even be infinite. And there may be lots more than 100 billion galaxies. So let's just say from an extremely conservative standpoint, there are at least 10,000 billion billion stars in the visible universe. We know of life on, in one place. You know, but, but also, just, I don't have a slide on this because I cut this down a little bit for tonight, but, but we mentioned uh, exoplanets, too. Christine did earlier. And, you know, Kepler now, having doubled its exoplanets with 1,400 and, and change more um, a week or two ago, and it all seems like a flash to me, um, we now know of close to 3,000 exoplanets. There are another 2,000 at least candidates, I think, left from Kepler to to follow up on, that's looking at a 10 by 10 degree patch of sky between the constellations Cygnus and Lyra, a very small piece of sky. And most all of the depth of that, of those Kepler data, are a couple of hundred light years deep. The diameter of the Milky Way's disks is 100,000 light years, roughly. And imagine extrapolating that number then that more deeply and all over the entire sky and how many planetary systems that amounts to. It, it's mind-boggling. And that then, you know, that's one galaxy, of course, as we mentioned. So could we be the only life in the universe? I don't think so. But let's end with the Orion Nebula because it's such a friendly nebula 
to contemplate with life. I think we need to, uh, as people who are interested in astronomy and love the subject and love following the science and so on, help to share our enthusiasm uh, of reality and the things that we're discovering uh, and turn off to some degree, maybe just a little bit, once in a while, some of that nonsense that seems to be pervading our world more and more. Um, think of an Earth on, on which the majority of people celebrated science all the time. Sometimes when I'm looking out in the milieu, I wonder, are there worlds where the scientists are the heroes? And, you know, gosh, I love music, and I'm not going to say this to Brian May, but, uh, you know, I love sports, you know, Green Bay Packers. Well, the Patriots are pretty good, too. Um, <laughs> but imagine places where science is really held in the high regard uh, uh, that it really deserves. You know, everyone believes in applied science, at least, when they're lying in a hospital bed. Imagine if everyone believed in pure science and what it brings to the world and spacecraft missions in practical terms all the time. What a world that would be. And if we can help to share that enthusiasm and spread it among our friends, it would be perhaps eventually a different place. Thank you very much. of the new cosmos, what would you add in there? Because there's been so much new stuff. <laughs> well, of course you publish a book like this, which came out in January. That's an excellent question. What would you add in a second edition of the book? Thank you very much. The book was published in January, a few weeks before the announcement of the detection of gravitational waves <laughs> from two merging black holes 1.3 billion light years away of a couple of dozen, three dozen solar masses each. I know what I'm going to say to Kit Thorne and Starmus next month. Thanks, guy. No, that's one thing. The, the problem with a book like this, seriously, is that this stuff is evolving so rapidly. We talked about the Kepler announcement as well. You'd have to revise to do a second edition of this book every chapter uh, to some to greater or lesser degrees. So maybe y'all do that, but you wouldn't want to have, to have to do it every year. It would become a full-time job, I think. <laughs> so, but there would be a lot of things to revise because there's so much work being done on all these hot fields. Great question. Thank you. There was a young gentleman right over here. Yes. What started the Big Bang? Ooh. <laughs> How much what? time you got? <laughs> I'm glad we worked right into the easy question. What, what started or created the Big Bang? And this was a question that Albert Einstein often uh, asked and, and commented on. And nobody knows what uh, pre-existed, what came before the Big Bang or what caused the Big Bang. Or whether we're the only universe and there are other universes, the so-called multiverse of many universes or not. Because we can only see what we can observe with science in our universe. And we can't observe anything before the Big Bang. And you can take that scientifically as pure science, or you can think about it philosophically. Uh, science is sort of a religion to some people, although you know, a lot of people would say that you, know, uh, you can think of whatever deity you would like, put the Big Bang there. Nobody knows, and it's really not science's ability to answer that question. If I do get an answer for that, let me get your number. <laughs> an excellent question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Assuming that the Earth had oceans when the large impact happened to form the moon, what would your speculation be on the effect of the impact on the oceans? And what do you think the ultimate origin of the uh, Earth's water is? Excellent question. If Earth had, if early Earth had oceans at the time of the uh, large impact that created the moon, what would the effect have been on the oceans, and what is the source of Earth's ocean water? And that second part, I'll get to in a second here, 
I, I think that the Thea impact happened before there was much ocean formation on Earth. So that was really early, 4.3 billion years, 4.53 billion years ago. So then the oceans in a cool early Earth uh, happened over the next several hundred million years. It used to be, about 20 years ago, exceptionally trendy to think that, well, comets delivered all the water to Earth, and that's why we have a lot of oceans, because we know the late heavy bombardment that came later than the Thea impact. There were huge numbers of small bodies coming in here and impacting the early Earth, and those included many, many asteroids and comets. And I wrote a book about comets a couple years before this for Cambridge and went through all that literature. So short answer is that now it's thought that comets contributed a lesser amount of water than people thought they did 20 years ago. Maybe something like 10 to 15 percent, and that a huge amount of early Earth's water came from icy asteroids from the Kuiper Belt and outer uh, from the, there's a thing called the scattered disk beyond the Kuiper Belt, and a lot of stuff got kicked in and impacted with Earth icy asteroids, different than comets, although they're often lumped together, meaning uh, which they're not really to planetary scientists. And believe it or not, and this was stunning to me, and sorry, it's a long answer, a lot of water, supposedly, by modeling, accreted in very small amounts on particles that came together and accreted Earth uh, early on, even before the lunar formation impact. So without having to be, you know, and, and that's very strange because the feeling is that the inner solar system that early on was very hot. But it wasn't hot enough to evaporate all of the water molecules that adhered to grains that stuck together and made Earth. Earth's core, which is amazing. Do we have any questions up top? Yes, sir. You said that uh, the Milky Way and Andromeda were colliding. Which of the two galaxies is larger? Which of the two galaxies is larger among the Andromeda and Milky Way galaxies? The Andromeda galaxy is much larger in terms of mass than the Milky Way. Its disk, its bright disk, is about 120,000 light years across as opposed to the Milky Way is roughly 100,000. So it's 20% larger in terms of the bright matter diameter, but it has a vastly larger dark matter halo. And because of the spatial uh, dimensions of it, has much, much more mass, even though linearly it's only 20% longer. The bright, but you know what I mean? So the Andromeda galaxy is the big guy on the block in the local group. We're number two, and M33 is number three in our local group. Uh, yes, sir. Um, how do you know the difference, or tell the difference, between two things moving apart from each other and the space in between them expanding? Well, that brings up a very two points to come in on. The, again, an excellent question. You can measure the expansion of things, moving the rates through redshift, through looking at specific lines in their spectra, say, of galaxies, and seeing how much they're shifted, which Hubble stumbled on, frankly, in 1929 at Mount Wilson, that principle, and has been used very successfully to measure the expansion rate of galaxies away from us, for example. Um, but that also, what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. Just one question. How do you know the difference between two things moving apart and space in between them expanding? Oh, and space, well, that brings up, yeah. well, well, they're co-mingled. You can't know the precise difference because you bring up an incredibly important point. And that is something also that I cut out here because I didn't want to go on forever. But the size of the universe. If the universe is 13.8 billion years old, which we know that it is, observationally, and the speed of light is a constant, you would think that over that time period, the universe is maybe roughly twice and some change that diameter. But it's actually, at a minimum, the visible universe, again, discounting inflation, is about 93 billion light years across. Well, how can that be? Mathematically, it doesn't seem to make sense. But 
The universe isn't things expanding apart from each other in a big empty box. The space-time itself expands over time. So early on, that one centimeter in the early universe becomes two centimeters of space. And that's part of the galaxy's expansion away from you, is space itself expanding over time. That's an outstanding question. I know it's one of those that's not very satisfying. <laughs> you know, you know uh, anecdotally or, or in terms of common sense, but you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. We'll wrap this up with two more questions, and I had the gentleman over there. Yes. Uh, hi. Is there any proof that uh, wormholes exist in the Any proof of wormholes? And, and what was the second part? How do you feel? And how do I feel? <laughs> I love wormholes. <laughs> I checked out the Andromeda Galaxy just the other week. <laughs> there, there's theoretical uh, proposal for wormholes that goes back to Kip Thorne and Stephen and others, even just before them, in the 1960s and 70s largely. Um, and they could exist. But again, the practicalities of traveling somewhere through a black hole are very limiting. It's like, well, you could travel you know, to the Alpha Centauri and land there and shake hands with people on the pleasure system. Um, but for one thing, there, there are two kinds of black holes. Stellar black holes, the gravitational attraction of a Cygnus X1 companion black hole, as you approached it, it would pull a human being into a string of protons about 10 kilometers long. <laughs> so even if it were a wormhole, and mathematically you could come out somewhere and, and be uh, transported and use it as a, you know, a cosmic travel bureau, it wouldn't do you a whole lot of good if you could come out somewhere else, <laughs> if you were spaghetti fighting. <laughs> and both Kip and especially Stephen have written about this recently in several books. Now, however, a supermassive black hole, you could cross the accretion disk, the point of no return of a supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy, and you might not as a human being even feel it. However, you would still, Stephen argues, eventually get pulled down to the singularity and crushed. And therefore, wormholes, if they exist as a travel mechanism, are no good practically, or as time machines, as Stephen says it, are conceptually plausible mathematically. But in practical terms, they wouldn't work. And the universe has no time travel and time machines. And Stephen has said some pretty outrageous things. So if he's that adamant about it, I think I believe him pretty well. You're bumming us out, Dave. You know, no one who needs reality. You know? We have, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here already. <laughs> so the fellow in the back there will be the last question before we wrap it up. Yep. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, David, for an awesome talk. Thank you. Um, Carl Sagan believed that by now we would have discovered evidence of alien civilizations on other worlds, and yet SETI's come up empty. Do you have any speculations on why that is? It's a really hard problem. And remember that there's fatigue of electromagnetic radiation over time. And the guy who's brilliant about this, who was good enough to read my chapter on the meaning of life in the universe and comment on it, is Seth Shostak. You may know of him at the SETI Institute. Uh, Jill, also, Jill Tarter is involved in the Starmus group as well. They're brilliant people, and you really have to be looking at the right place at the right time also. You know, it's not as if there are pencil beams going everywhere and they go on forever, and the energy doesn't fatigue, and you ought to have seen someone, and the Fermi paradox therefore works. You really have to be good and lucky. Um, optical SETI may make things somewhat easier over the coming years, but again, funding for SETI is diminishing, and that's a real problem because, you know, who would have expected them after two or three decades, really, to, to score? That, that's pretty demanding, given the, the size of the universe and the size of the job, you know. So I, I think it's something, if it doesn't take away from other 
major research said he should continue on, and it may be, you know, it may be 500 years or something for a detection. Although there, are, I, I don't know if I'll name names, but there are people who believe that in our lifetimes we will have a detection. I mean, who are real live scientists in important places. <laughs> I'm not sure whether I agree with them fully or not. It's a hard problem. All right, so with that, we will bring it to a close.